This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm Michael David Wilson, and every episode alongside my co-host Bob Pastorella, we chat with the world's best writers about writing, life lessons, creativity, and much more. Now, today's episode is a little different because it is a collaboration with my friend and the host of the ARC Party podcast, Rob Olson, perhaps best known for the 10 years or so that he was a podcaster for Booked Podcast. And together with Rob, I am going to be chatting with another good friend and a phenomenally talented writer, Max Booth III. Now, Max has a brand new collection out today from Apocalypse Party Press. It is entitled Abnormal Statistics, and it is for that reason that me and Rob Olson decided to sit down and chat with Max Booth. Now, as with almost every time I chat with Max, be it on or off air, The conversation did quickly descend into absolute chaos and innuendo within the first few minutes. Though you won't be able to tell from the rather sensible episode that I'm about to present to you. However, after the outro, if you choose to accept this, then you can prepare for around 17 minutes of outtakes and absolute chaos. So before we jump into things, let us have a quick advert break. Impoverished college dropout Nick is desperate for money, so he signs up for a highly experimental study at the isolated drug corp compound. Nick knows the study involves improving the human genome to extend life, and he knows it involves some minor abdominal surgery, but he isn't prepared for the strange after effects, the nausea, the itching, the unusual abdominal swelling, the internal squirming. Now available in paperback from Mother Horror and Cemetery Gates Media, book number six in the My Dark Library line, Corporate Body by R.A. Busby. Arthur Carson Winter presents Soft Targets, a developed new word horror out March 22nd from Tenebrous Press. A pair of office drones discover a loophole in time that makes some days less real than others, allowing them to act on their darkest impulses without fear of reprisal. Their morals become more slippery and their fantasies more violent, and soon they will have to decide what line they won't cross. Soft Targets is a timely, reality-bending novella about the easy surrender to violence and the addictive appeal of tragedy as entertainment. More information at tenebuspress.com. Okay, well, with that said, here it is. It is Max Booth III and special guest Rob Olson on This Is Horror. Welcome to This Is Horror arc party edition we are gonna be talking to max booth and today i've got my co-host rob olson formerly of booked podcast now of arc party rob tell us a little bit about yourself and the arc party concept sure um so i have been doing podcasts uh since April of 2011. Primarily, I was doing book reviews and author interviews. And <laughs> um, that was with Booked. Booked ended uh, in the in our 10th year, on our 10th anniversary, we ended that podcast. And now the new podcast I'm doing is called The Arc Party. And essentially, the idea of this is instead of a review podcast, it is um, pre-publication promotion with authors. So you have a book that's coming out. It's not out yet. I talk to you and... Um, we talk about the book and, and just kind of get people aware of stuff before it's out so they can pre-order and engage with their libraries and stuff like that. Yeah. And so today we are going to be chatting with Max Booth. He will be releasing in a matter of days, abnormal statistics, a short story collection from 
Apocalypse Party Press. And so, I mean, normally with Arc Party, you put these out quite a bit ahead of the release. I mean, you recently spoke to Cassandra Kaur, and their new book isn't coming out until May. But with right. Max, this is going to go live, and then the next day, boom, <laughs> you can buy Abnormal Statistics. Now, it may be because I took quite a long time to actually have a date that was ready for us to record this. It may not be. That could be one of the reasons. But anyway, Max is here now. Max, how are you doing? I just want to say, I've been ready to do this for a while, and Rob has as well. So <laughs> oh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> he's, he's I'm doing great. Out. He's hanging you out. <laughs> People can I'm doing awesome. re- read between the lines. I'm neither <laughs> confirming nor denying the reason. So you, you can come up with your own conclusions. But so you got abnormal statistics coming out in a Dude. few days. Yeah. So, I mean, how did this one come about? How did you first land the collection with Apocalypse Party Press? Yeah, so I became I knew, I became a real apocalypse a few a few years ago when Ben who who runs Apocalypse he emailed me to just tell me basically that he was a fan of Perpetual Motion Machine in my press and how it had kind of inspired him to begin his own press because at the time I was also looking at a shitty nine to five job while also trying to do this press he also has a a similar type of job and he found it kind of motivational and i thought that was a cool thing to read from someone so they were always in the back of my mind and it helped that apocalypse releases really cool books like negative space by bl yeager and Mm. bonding by maggie seabilt most of the books i've read by apocalypse are super cool and they have a pretty just nice vibe to them that i enjoy so i forget what led to me submitting a collection to them but i knew i wanted to get one out and i didn't want to self-publish it like i've done a lot of my books recently because i just don't have as much time it seems um so i was thinking of presses i thought might be interested so i hit up apocalypse to see if they might be interested and i have a collection and i think i mentioned the possibility of just doing a novella as well ben seemed interested in i have all those so i went through and i compiled a collection and i sent it over it was pretty long also it had a shitty title that i can't even remember now it was a bad title if i sent them the collection and he accepted it and then as we were going through edits we kind of discovered many of them had a theme of dysfunctional families so once we realized this it's something i didn't even think about until he pointed it out but once this was something we both knew was in the collection it made it really easy to go through and trim the collection quite a bit to cut away the stories that did not fit the theme so i think the original collection was like eighty thousand worlds long and we cut it down to i think like fifty one thousand. Mm-hmm. and later on i finished the novella in the Anna death song and originally i was just going to release it as a standalone but i kind of had this epiphany that it was perfect for this collection because it was almost like like a summary of every other story vibe wise and it just felt like it had a good home in that collection so i hit up ben i sent him the uh, novella and i said what do you think about including this in the collection he liked it he loved it we put it in the collection and it shot up to like seventy eight thousand worlds, which is good because maybe fifty one thousand was not quite long enough in retrospect. 
So I'm pretty happy with the length it is now, and I'm glad we uh, ended up cutting so much, which allowed room to add this novella. Yeah, and I mean, in terms of the collection, I feel that it's a very fair reflection of the kind of breadth of your writing style and story aesthetics, because, I mean, Indiana Death Sung has to be up there with the absolute bleakest things that you've ever written. Um, I mean, there's still, there is still some humor in it, but, you know, I think the, the darkness definitely overshadows that. Although I'd, I'd say having read the, the script as well, which are we allowed to talk about? I, I mean, you wrote a script for it. Can we say that? Yeah, I've written, I've written a script adaptation, but, um, it's not with anyone, so um, I just wrote it um, on spec, and hopefully we will sell it to someone in the future. Yeah, so the, the the script for me, it seemed to have more comedic elements than, you know, the novella. The novella definitely was tonally darker, I would say. Um, but then, I mean, in contrast to Indiana Death Song, you have stories like Fish, which is pretty much just like comedic <laughs> throughout. And I mean, it, it seems to be with your fiction, you know, you typically have these two modes where you've got like, uh, we need to do something is, you know, in that darker mode, but then you've got something like carnivorous lunar activities, which is much more comedic. So I mean, was that something you were conscious of when you and Ben were putting the collection together that you wanted to be able to showcase these two sides of your writing? I don't think it was something we discussed or I thought much about with this collection because most of my shield fiction tends to be on the bleak old side and most of it I don't think has a lot of comedy. Like I would say, yeah, there's some bits and pieces throughout that have comedic moments, but I would say my, my, uh, my novels, my, my big books, they tend to have a lot more comedy in them because I, at least with me, most of my comedy tends to happen when I have a long amount of time to develop kill tilts and you get to understand like how they behave and then you get the you get to add these jokes through the dialogue and behaviors mm. but with uh, shield fiction you don't really have that time to uh develop that way and plus with this collection i think i just wanted it to be like this is a whole collection. So yeah. that made it pretty easy to not include some of my comedic short stories because I do have some. Usually anytime I've written a, a, a comedic short story or flash fiction, it was feel like a public reading I was doing because mm -hmm. I think when you do a, like a, a reading, it should be comedic. So I've written a lot of stuff like that specifically with the intention of reading it out loud, but none of that's in the collection. And I can see how fish could be pretty funny. I don't think I intended it to be that way, but <laughs> I can also see how it just is funny. Like if that was made into a movie, I'm pretty sure it would be uh, not that serious because yeah. it's about a kid just, fucking a woman who's menstruating endlessly <laughs> yeah it's definitely absurd and i think yeah. the absurdism leads to humor yeah 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 i particularly love your story note for fish because mo most of the story <laughs> notes you've got some kind of long-winded uh, not long-winded long, long kind of answer as to how you came about this and I'm, I'm just gonna find the exact wording even though i, pr I pretty much know the sentence but with fish the story notes go i lost my virginity to an older woman on her period sometimes it's as simple as that folks <laughs> i mean i think that's a pretty good lesson phil streel are you telling any expiring inspiring aspiring right old south tale um just, you know maybe they listen to this podcast for uh, advice on how to write 
and um, that's something I would um, tell them. You know, the the most in- innocent uh, experience could lead to a great story, such as losing your virginity to an old woman. That will feel it. You could write a story about monster lady who uh, corrupts a child into killing families. <laughs> yeah. Why not? Yeah. We'll say a good and it's not good. <laughs> it's a very specific <laughs> writing. I, mean, I, th- I, 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 th- I think that anecdote was, was uh, in On Writing by Stephen King, too. <laughs> Here's, uh, so about that, though, like, one not about that, but about... Um, I, from my perspective of reading this, uh, and and we'll get into this probably deeper when we start talking about some of the stories. But um, when I read some of this, I definitely picked up on the autobiographical nature of it. And so, like, and and obviously, you said that this was inspired by, you know, a real experience. And then my mind automatically starts asking, like, did the woman he lost his virginity to convince him to start murdering people or like, where was that the lot? You know what I'm saying? So like with this collection, I guess what I'm saying is there's a lot of stuff that seems like it's informed from you and it's obvious kind of usually where the barrier is, but sometimes it's like, uh, I don't know. I think pretty much anything I've written has that element to it of being recycled from my own life and then kind of frankensteined into something else like with fish specifically yes i did end up killing a few kids but (laughs) the names were different so that's kind of like you know i'm able to be creative with it it's just gotta change the names i mean i don't have to but like the names in real life just didn't seem that fun to read so you want to change it so the readers like ah this is this is entertaining <laughs> yeah yeah and i think with fish as with i mean all of your stories like that the pacing is great you always have such a kind of sense of you know getting that story progressing from beat to beat it is all very kind of lean i guess so uh, what good old Richard Thomas would refer to as trimming the fat. And I mean, I, I think as well, there's a there's a definite sense of escalation because whilst it starts off as pretty comedic in my opinion, then like, you know, when the horror kicks in in that kind of final act, oh, it really <laughs> ramps up very quickly indeed. Oh, thank you. I am um, glad you... You picked up on that, Michael. <laughs> I don't know what to say, but I mean, thank you. I pacing, I think, is something that's pretty essential, and I think it can be difficult to get right. But I don't know. Maybe just one way to do that is to have a lot of a lot of manic energy. So when you write the story, it kind of matches that at some point. Um, something I just remembered about fish, and I think it's kind of funny, is there's a section of that story that describes someone's face caving in like a rotting pumpkin. And I just remembered for a long time when I was a teenager, I would use that same description a lot, specifically Mm. a rotting pumpkin collapsing to describe a face getting just crushed. I don't know what was going on with that. I, I think I just, like, I guess when you feel beginning writing and you come up with something, like, by your, yourself that isn't just mm. stolen from someone else, you kind of cling to that and you use it as much as possible. But I recall, like, re- using that description quite a bit. It, I, uh, I, it also just hit me now as an afterthought that I do have a rotting pumpkin on my front pilch right now. I uh, it's from last Halloween. I, I forgot to do anything with it, and like last week, it was still fine. And then, like within a couple of days, it just fucking flattened to this black carcass. And I don't know what to do with it now. Yeah, I was on the I, phone to you when you discovered that, and then <laughs> subsequently <laughs> saw the photo of the pumpkin aftermath. 
can put that in the show notes for people interested. Yeah. My dogs keep trying to eat it. I wish I was on a laptop. I could just walk outside and show you, but I'm on a desktop. So I think if I unplugged it, I would lose video access. Yeah, that would. We'll take you at your <laughs> yeah, word, you definitely I think. would. Yeah. So, we, we like, can... for those watching, ima- imagine this is a pumpkin. <laughs> that's it. That's it. That's all, <laughs> all right. I mean, we'll, with this collection, obviously, there was quite a bit of discussion then in terms of what to and what not to include, given that you submitted what over a hundred thousand words or so initially so i mean what did that process look like and were there any stories that ben particularly wanted you not to include that you were adamant like no this absolutely goes in or vice versa no it was the opposite i think after we did it i came up with a list I think he also maybe came up with a list of ones he thought could be removed. Mm. And I'm 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 not really um precious about my writing usually, so I mean if someone's well not just anyone, but him specifically, I trusted him. I think he has good mm-hmm. taste and he was publishing it. So anything he suggested I was pretty quick to remove. And um, some of mine, he was like, well, maybe we should keep this one. And I was like, oh, nah, let's just fucking cut it. Yeah. There was one that the last one we cut, it's called um, Flowers Blooming in the Season of Atrophy. And it was my really first propane publication. It was in uh, Michael Bailey's uh, Chiral Mad 2 anthology. Mm. Um, I ended up cutting it. He thought maybe it should stay, but... I decided to cut it because the uh, well, not because of the plot. The plot is basically it's about a school shooting that happens, but it was a little too positive, I think, <laughs> which sounds funny. But it the the way it's written, it's written like a little bit too, I don't know, Disney and spiraling. It's about a school shooting that's prevented. But the way it's written, it just didn't seem to fit the same vibe. And I don't think I would have written it that way now. And I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm still – I look back fondly on it because of the – the uh, it being my really feels pro publication. But beyond that, I don't know. Going back and reading it again for the collection, it just didn't sit right. And the only other little story that really comes to mind that we did leave, but I was really on the fence about for the longest mm. time, was a zombie story called uh, uh, In the Attic of the Universe. What the fuck is that story yeah. called? Hold on. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the title, In the okay. Attic of the Universe. So that's a super old story that I was afraid just wasn't written well. Um, I wrote it, I think, when I was a teenager. I can't remember now. Um so I was afraid it was just wasn't the same quality, but Ben seemed to like it. And I, I liked the idea of having something from way back then in the collection for people reading to kind of like compel how hopefully my, I have improved as a writer throughout the last decade or so. And yeah, I mean, I, I think that's okay. Like I love Stephen King collections, especially the, the feels like three or four collections of his, and something that would be, always be cool is like seeing like the decades each one was originally published in. It would I always found it kind of neat to trace like the history of Stephen King's stories. If I could say one thing about that particular zombie story, uh, I would say that, and this is just me reflecting on because I read the book about maybe a month ago. Um, it seems like that story has a lot of heart. Like it's got a lot more, um, uh, I don't know, like positive kind of vibes to like relationships, like in, you know, interactions between people, even though it's like a terrible situation. Um, and, and while you were describing it, I was thinking to myself, there's gotta be some kind of like hope somewhere in this book because a lot of it gets pretty bleak. So, um, that's, that's kind of like my first thought that I, that came to mind when you, when you were talking about it was, 
there does seem to be a little bit more of like a positivity to that story than maybe a lot of the other ones. Yeah, I mean, I guess I hadn't grown yet as a rattle to the schedule that <laughs> still is no hope. <laughs> yeah, and that, that, that's what I was thinking as Rob was saying. It. It's like, you know, you wrote that one when you were younger, so you were you were less jaded or one might say less aware yeah. of the world. So there was a little bit more optimism. And then as you got older, it's like, no, no. <laughs> it's pretty, I mean, looking back, I'm pretty fond of the premise it has. For those listening, the premise of this story is zombie apocalypse. It's a a man living in this attic with his child. It's a baby. And, oh shit, I forgot the premise. Uh, Isn't he bitten? (laughs) Yeah, he's bitten. He's been bitten. So he knows sooner or later he's he's going to become fucking zombified. And this baby is going to be left alone. So he has the uh, dilemma, like, what do I do? Do I just let this baby go and see what happens, or do I shoot my baby and then uh, shoot myself? I mean, that's something I tend to um, approach a lot with many of these stories is coming up with this really fucked up dilemma or situation they've someone's found themselves in and exploring how they react. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I think I probably found this more traumatic than I would have if I'd have read it before becoming a father, because I'm really trying to put myself in this situation and decide, well, what, what the hell would I do? Cause I'm, I yeah. mean, yeah, you, you've effectively got the ultimatum. Well, do, do I take care of uh, <laughs> this issue, you know, but, and uh, yeah. the, the, the baby, <laughs> Will have be, be no more, yeah. or do do I kind of exit and and hope, or don't know that it's pretty unlikely that something good that, that you know will happen? But yeah, yeah, it's. Uh, I'll tell you what just ended my brain as you were talking. You said ultimatum, and <laughs> it occurred to me that you know how some people say tomato, tomato, tomato. What right. if you did like ultimatum, ultimatum? I mean, that, <laughs> I don't... that's that's why I began laughing as you were talking because suddenly I couldn't stop thinking about that. I, I apologize, but um, this is the uh, ALC penalty, baby. This is what happens <laughs> when you get a little too uh, loose with the coffee. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, th- thank you for sharing <laughs> that thought with us. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know who else I could have told, so <laughs> I had no to tell one's, somebody. No, no one's going to think of ultimatum the same way ever again. Yeah, or ultimatum, ultimatum. I guess. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. I mean, Rob, if you're in this situation <clears throat> with your your hypothetical child, I mean, what what do you think you would do? All right, so I'm going to tell you a quick story. So I uh, I don't have my own children, but I've um, the person I've been dating for the last two and a half years has uh, kids that are eight and thirteen, mm-hmm. and uh, so I've known these kids for a couple of years now, and I really care about them. And the the older one recently was like tr- chasing the cat or something like that, and then turned quickly and like hit their head on the door frame, and it was very frightening in the moment obviously they ended up being fine but we had to take them to the emergency room and everything Mm -hmm. and um that i'd never felt like such horror and such like a feeling of just i don't want this person to feel this way that you know two two years ago if you asked me that question i think my response would have been um way different than now because like you never want to see your kid suffer And so it is like this kind of impossible situation where it's like, I am I, is it weak to not do the thing to prevent future suffering? Or is it weak to do the thing to like, there's, there's no answer. So I I think that two years ago, I would have been like, oh, it's easy, just, you know, do the right thing and, and prevent the kid from suffering in the future. But now I don't know if I, I don't know if I would be able to, to do that, you know? Yeah. 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 What about you, Michael? What would you do? I, I think that in general, despite 
whenever I encounter really difficult situations, and I've, you know, I've had a few in the last few years, I'm a relentless optimist. So I just don't think, you know, I could kill the kid because there's gonna be that bit of hope that something good might happen in the end. Um, I mean, I imagine too, if you decide to kill the kid and you, you can feel yourself turning but then like it, you, you never actually fully turn. And then you realize later you have this rare mutation <laughs> that meant you could never turn, but uh, yeah. Oh, well, oh shit. Well, maybe it's like, oh wait, being a zombie is awesome. I need to bite my kids so they can join me. This is actually <laughs> pretty great. Um, I, I, I think too, I mean, the, the optimism, e even if I turn, it might be, that like you know it's not zombies who discover the kid and uh, imagine if you had killed your kid yeah. and someone else were to discover them so yeah i think i'd uh i don't know what what would you do like maybe <laughs> barricade the room as much as you can but may maybe also in the house be like you know <laughs> write a note kid in bathroom because yeah. I assume that like zombies aren't that good at reading and comprehending, but if a non-zombie turns up, oh, kid in bathroom. Okay, well, let's. <laughs> but instead, it says, uh, "Kid, please, bathroom open." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a Walking Dead joke. Um, it reminds me now, thinking about it, um, the end of The Mist, the film adaptation. Mm. Have you guys both seen the movie? I have, yeah. I have not. Oh, my God. Okay. I don't know how to talk about this movie now. Never mind. <laughs> Moving on. Spoil the ending. Okay. <laughs> so, if, you, if you're worried about spoiling it for me, don't worry about it. Go for it. All right. So, The Mist, it, um, it ends... With um, the husband, the father, um, he's driving away with uh, his kid and a bunch of other people who have survived this uh, apocalyptic uh, hell thing that's happening. They're driving into the mist, and they decide we'll just keep driving, but then they, uh, I think, ran out of gas, and they were surrounded by the mist and all the creatures around them, and they have a, a gun with enough bullets to kill everybody but one. So they decide, okay, the the, the man, he, he shoots everybody, including his son, and now it's just him. So he runs out after killing his fucking son and then sees, oh, the mist is going away and the government has come to save them all. So that just brought to mind that ending. And now it's really hilarious to me imagining like what the next scene was like. Like yeah. <laughs> him trying to explain <laughs> this mass homicide he committed. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Oh, yeah. He probably went to prison. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, spoilers on the mist. <laughs> it was good to call out spoilers after you talk about them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so every breath is a choice. I, I, all I'm going to say is like, there is, there is one word in that story and it is the best word in the entire book. If you ask me, I did not see the ending of this story coming and the twist happens in the very last word. And I got through this whole story and I got to that last word and I was like, yes, it was like the most satisfying, like, sh like I did not see it coming. And even like, so it was building and building and like, um, uh, so like the premise for people who are listening, who didn't read this already um, is there's a guy who I'm on the right story, right? There's a guy yeah, who, um, yeah. The, this guy breaks into his family's house and like gives the guy a choice. Uh, the guy walks in on all this happening, gives the guy the choice. Like he has to choose whether the the guy kills the wife or the kid. Yeah. So like, that's the premise of the story. And then um, without uh, spoiling too much, like, you know, this guy's life just kind of like crumbles apart after that. And it's just this pathetic kind of sad sack person. Um, and the way that you ended the story though, that turn that you take never saw it coming. And it was just so perfect and powerful. I was really impressed by, 
um, the like how you really led me on the path of like this guy is just like trudging through this sad existence. I never saw that ending coming, and it was probably for me the most, even though Indiana Death Songs fucked me up crazy. Like mm-hmm. this story was probably had the most powerful moment for me in the whole book. Oh, thank you. Um, that I forget when I wrote it exactly, but it had a difficult time getting accepted any place. In fact, the 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 anthology that did publish it, it was accepted by someone who had rejected it like five years previously, <laughs> but then they accepted it this time. I don't know why, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I don't have a lot of memories of where that idea even came from but i do recall struggling a bit with what to do with it because i had the initial premise of someone has to make a decision of who dies a wife or child but i didn't know what to do beyond that so i i remember once the the second half the ending coming to mind that's when everything clicked I got pretty excited about writing it, but I I do think I spent a long time trying to figure out what happens after the initial thing that happens happens. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe one reason as well that you found this one kind of more personally effective than Indiana Death Song is just like it's a premise that one can, anyone can easily relate to. Whereas I, I guess with, Mm -hmm. Indiana Death Song, it, whilst you know you can empathize to some level, unless you've had that kind of childhood, then that there's like that other layer that makes it harder to to fully put yourself in that position. But yeah, I mean, this premise specifically, I imagine, is something everyone has put themselves through. Like it's a mind game almost. Yeah. Like, okay, of my family, who would I save? That's basically what this is with that. But that second, like, it, it's interesting that you say that it took you a while to come to that, like, uh, that conclusion to come to that conclusion uh, yeah. and figure out what the ending of that story was going to be because um, uh, masterful. But like, I can imagine you were just like struggling with that story. And then one day you were just like, this is it. So, yeah, uh, I mean, we have a super fucked up thing that happens. But you can't, that's just, that can't be all that happens in this really, you know, it's going to be incomplete feeling. Right. Yeah, exactly. Like they were like, what's the point? You just, you're just giving a hypothetical, but like the, what you did yeah. with the end of it makes it more of a story, makes it more. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. In terms of like, you know, coming up with endings, is that like a lot of writers kind of tend to struggle with that is that something that is particularly difficult for you because you you generally fucking nail it it does it like on on the page it doesn't seem to be a difficult thing but i know like how much we can kind of labor on to like sticking that ending and getting it right yeah well thank you i appreciate that um i think about endings a lot with a shield story, I don't begin writing anything until I know the ending. Typically, the ending comes first, except in the example of every breath is a choice. I had the beginning before I had an, an ending. Mm. But if I don't know the ending, especially in the shield story, it's just going to come across as this aimless thing, I think. But it's good to have, like, I mean, I look at it like, writing a joke you need Mm. to have the punchline even if the punch in this case the punchline is usually something horrific it's still a punchline Mm. and you can't write the build up to that unless you know what it is and then you can come up with the beginning and then everything else leading to that with books i sometimes have an idea in mind i usually have a vague sense of how i want it to to end I don't always have like a concrete idea with Indiana death song, no fucking idea how that was going to end, which is probably why it took me so long to write. If I mm-hmm. imagine if I had come up with an ending before I wrote it, I would have finished it quite quickly, but that wasn't the case. 
But yeah, I think endings, I mean, the ending is the last thing you read. So if it's a bad ending, you will not going to have good uh, memories of that story. Even a shitty story with a good ending is going to leave an okay impression on you. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And I just wanted to go back to something you, know, you, you said earlier about when you're doing live readings, you know, it's important to find a comedic piece. And that's something that, you know, I completely agree with. But if if you're doing something like promoting, you know, Indiana Death Song or we need to do something, so pr pretty bleak stories, what what's your approach there? Would would you just read like a complete story on, on that kind of tour that's nothing to do with the book? Or would you yeah. take yeah. I yeah, I, I've thought about this a lot and I don't know what the right solution is because it's it's I agree. It's almost like false advertising, maybe like this is not the type of book you are going to be buying. Um, yeah, I've read one section of Indiana Death Song out loud to an audience and I think the audience liked it. I didn't enjoy the experience. Um, it was a. So last year at a convention in Austin called Killolcon, I right. read a section from it at that. Now, um, we haven't talked about this novella yet, but it was it's mostly about my own experience as a teenager with my uh, mom and dad. And the week of Killolcon, my mom died. And then I went to Killolcon and I read a section from it. And I think I was a fucking maniac as I was reading it. <laughs> I was definitely on the verge of just falling to pieces. And um, I guess being overly emotional is uh, a possibility when you are reading something super serious. And that could have its good sides, I think. But I don't tend to uh, write a lot of stuff that quite taps that way maybe i do i don't know i don't think i have enough pieces that you can read without context that have that type of emotional uh vein to poke but with comedy i don't know you you require less context i think when you're reading like a flash fiction comedic piece mm. than you would something super bleak maybe it's also possible i'm just talking right now without thinking but I, th I think i'm making sense <laughs> um i'll give you an example of what i plan on reading um next week so i'm doing a few book related uh, reading events next week and i to promote this collection and i plan on writing a new flash flash fiction piece i haven't written it yet but i have it in my head what i'm gonna write and it has nothing to do with this collection but I think it's going to be pretty funny. I'll, I'll tell you the, the story idea and what happens in it because it's never going to be published in any place. It's just going to be something I read out loud. So a while ago, I got obsessed with this tweet this woman posted. Um, I'm trying to remember all the exact phrasing, but it's basically like this woman tweeted how hubby loves loves it when she puts three soft boiled eggs up a uh, vagina and then um the husband then like licks up the egg juices i think something like that it's really fucking gross but <laughs> i don't know <laughs> it's, it's amazing the way the the vivid images that come to mind when i read this tweet so the idea i have is i'm going to write a short story about this a flash fiction about this man who also reads the tweet he is going to begin <laughs> with them just joke just laughing it out like aha that's a gross tweet but then he's going to not be able to stop thinking about it and he's going to begin joking with his wife like haha, that would be crazy if you did that right but then it's going to not be just a joke it's going to be him like come on we could try and it happens they do it and he loves it it's the best fucking thing in the universe i mean he's so obsessed with these egg juices that the <laughs> ending is going to be him crawling into his wife's uh womb and living inside of her. <laughs> what? so that's what i'm gonna that's, that's that's what i'm gonna read to promote uh abnormal statistics i don't <laughs> know ending. if that's the right move <laughs> <laughs> it's the right move but that's what i'm thinking okay i think i'll call it three eggs
I, I, I know you be cool in it. I can hold free, but yeah. <laughs> I knew as soon as you said this tweet I read, I knew exactly <laughs> where you were going. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know how that translates to people buying this collection. Like, I mean, someone might enjoy the reading, they buy this and get home and go, what the fuck is this? Well, I might be losing in the audience by scaling away people with reading something like that because the collection isn't like that. But I don't know what else to do because I, I think like task number one when doing a live reading is to entertain. Yeah. I don't want to read anything that puts someone to sleep. So to me, the I need to come up with something fucking strange and hopefully funny and unforgettable. And uh, three eggs, I believe, is going to be that type of story. Yeah, yeah. I I feel yeah. I feel like if you do that, it's like look if if you've enjoyed this reading and you're buying the book based on that, maybe start by reading fish. You know, because if you if you <laughs> bought it specifically because of three eggs, and then you start with Indiana Death Song, it's like completely different mood. So I I, I reckon not a single egg in that book. No, no eggs in Indiana Death Song at all. Yeah, that's, that's true. Pretty odd. But, but I mean, the, the only other way yeah. you could do it is if you've got the live reading, and if if you can somehow do two extracts. I don't know if like is is this going to be like an interview with readings, and like you know you can stand up, do one reading about ten minutes later, you do another. I mean, the extract that probably would be most comedic is um the elevator scene <laughs> you know when it again kind of yeah when I, when I did yeah. um when i did the kill con i read two sections i read that scene to make people yeah. laugh and then i read a section when uh, i guess i can't talk about it but i read a, a much sad little section later on in the novella and i think that was a pretty good like one-two punch you get them laughing and then they will paying attention and then you can go in for the sad shit so i do think there is a place for sad stuff to read but you do need to hook them before you can like get them feeling anything yeah yeah and i i, I think you know with a live reading you want to entertain the people it's a different experience than just like you know sitting down and reading the book yourself and you know i've, I've had times where i've gone to readings and very accomplished writers have just like read um like a section of supernatural horror where it's very dense it's very literary <laughs> but it's just... supernatural fanfic <laughs> no no <laughs> but it you know just just reading this very kind of prose heavy description uh, it, it it doesn't mm -hmm. it doesn't really feel like it translates well for a live reading that's not where i'm gonna get the most out of that but if you've got something comedic or you've got something dialogue heavy then you're gonna get my attention yeah even the times i've read like sections from a book that was published i always take that section into a real document and revise it so it makes more sense to read out loud yeah. like yeah. I have, a, I have a speech impediment. So usually when I do that, I try to remove anything that I know I'm not going to say correctly. Or if I have too much exposition, I cut that and just like, just mm -hmm. like the, the fucking the bill bones of what I need to get across is what I read out loud. That's exactly what me and Bob did for the uh, launch of their watching. I took a section between the protagonist and the PI character. And I just basically formatted it like a script. And it's like, right, that's what we're reading. Uh, and, and this is a David James Keaton story. So take that with however much salt you need to take that with. But um, one thing I've noticed about him with live readings, because I've attended several uh, of his, is that um, sometimes he'll just do some sort of, this is something that happened to me recently you know, as, as like a thing he's talking about before he goes into a story. So like, I think if you're going just grim, if you had some sort of entertaining anecdote that was real life before going into just grim, like that could be a way to soften up the crowd without like, 
you know, um, yeah. necessarily having another piece because like he really got, he, there was one time in Chicago where he got basically the whole audience, like just really railing against the um, Chicago uh, uh, parking authority people because he had this really <laughs> compelling story about like getting his car towed. And then he went into the thing he was, he has his actual story. So like, yeah. I think that too could be a way to hook people in and get them on your side before. But I, here, here's the thing. Uh, caveat i don't i'm not an author i never have to stand up and read one of my things so like mm-hmm. you know I, I take that take that how you will but i i thought keaton yeah. was good at that as far as like being entertaining and get the audience on your side yeah that sounds like a good method i've never met keaton i've never seen him read but just his own like his style of prose feels really conversational so i bet oh, yeah. you yeah he's a he, he probably does great public readings something i've been debating trying to do one day soon at uh, at some events is doing uh an, an improv reading basically just having someone tell me like a few things about what a chili could be about and just fucking tell a chili for 10 minutes i'm pretty sure i could do it but it just depends when I think that would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I love that idea and anything that's going to make for a unique experience as well. It, you know, that's a reason to go to that reading and yeah, what you're describing, it almost has a kind of whose line is it anyway, kind of old TV comedy style to it. Yeah. I'd be I'd be totally up for like an event like that where you've got three or four readers and they're each given a different prompt. I mean, maybe you take like, you know, the, the prompt out of a hat. Oh, what have I got? Yeah, three <laughs> eggs, but you know, it could, could be any anything really. Why are they so um, wet? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't that called a... I think that's called like an exquisite culps, right? When you continue someone else's stream. Yes. Mm, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Any piece of art that like one person starts it and then like someone picks up where they left off. Yeah. Yeah. It would be fun to do that, but also have someone else assigned just for editing. Like if, mm. so they can just yell, stop and run out and go, <laughs> okay, this is real game. This is not real game. Let's do this again. I guess that's <laughs> like a movie direct almost, but still, that could be a fun yeah. bit to do on stage. Maybe I'll do that. I do a monthly show in Austin called The Ghoulish Show. I have uh, people come out and do performances on stage, usually comedic to a crowd. So now I'm thinking that would be a good uh, event, a good time to do that one of these days at that show is to do a, a live uh, exquisite culps. So thanks for the idea, folks. Yeah. Yeah. God, nice. if we wanted to practice it, we could probably get like a number of writers together and just do do one of these on a podcast to see like how does it logistically work and then depending how well it does or does not work would depend on whether we ever air it. <laughs> <laughs> it's fair. Thank you so much for listening to Max Booth on This Is Horror and the ARC Party podcast. In the near future, both me and Rob Olson will be chatting to Max Booth again to discuss and dissect the rest of the stories from Abnormal Statistics, including the incredible novella Indiana Death Song. Now, if you would like to get that and every episode ahead of the crowd, then do become our patron at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Not only are you going to get early bird access to each and every episode, but you can submit questions to guests that we have on the show. And coming up soon, we will be chatting to the likes of Grady Hendrix, Caroline Kepnes, and Joe R. Lansdale. So head over to patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Have a little look at what it is that we offer and see if it's a good fit for you. Now, a special thanks to Rob Olson for doing this with me. Not only is he the host of the Ark Party podcast, but as I said earlier, for 10 years, he was the host alongside Livia Sneddon of Booked Podcast. Now, I've said this before, but 
booked podcast was one of the inspirations for this as horror podcast. So without booked, there may not have been a this as horror podcast. And without booked, there definitely would be no Michael David Wilson and Bob Pastorella together. Because I first became aware of Bob and his work through the booked anthology. So do subscribe to Rob's podcast, The Ark Party, and do give the guy a lot of love because he deserves it. Such a good podcaster, such a good human being. Okay, before I wrap up, it is time for a quick advert break. Arthur Carson Winter presents Soft Targets, a novella of New Word Horror out March 22nd from Tenebrous Press. A pair of office drones discover a loophole in time that makes some days less real than others, allowing them to act on their darkest impulses without fear of reprisal. Their morals become more slippery and their fantasies more violent, and soon they will have to decide what line they won't cross. Soft Targets is a timely, reality-bending novella about the easy surrender to violence and the addictive appeal of tragedy as entertainment. More information at tenebuspress.com. Impoverished college dropout Nick is desperate for money, so he signs up for a highly experimental study at the isolated drug corp compound. Nick knows the study involves improving the human genome to extend life, and he knows it involves some minor abdominal surgery, but he isn't prepared for the strange after effects, the nausea, the itching, the unusual abdominal swelling, the internal squirming. Now available in paperback from Mother Horror and Cemetery Gates Media, book number six in the My Dark Library line, Corporate Body by R.A. Busby. Now next episode, we will present another This Is Horror Awards episode, and this time it will be for the short story collection and the anthology of the year. So get ready and get excited for that one. Now do not forget to show us some love on our social media channels, particularly TikTok, Twitter, and for video episodes, YouTube. Now believe you me, you might want to catch the Max Booth episode in video format, especially for the outtakes, which are absolutely chaotic. And speaking of which, they are coming up after the theme tune. So if you want to hear innuendo, sex talk, and general bullshit, then you are just minutes away. And if not, well, I mean, I've warned you, so you better turn off now. Put on a different podcast, listen to a little bit of Old Gods of Appalachia or Hawk and Cleaver's The Other Story. Why not give that reprobate Max Booth's podcast a little bit of a go? Ghoulish. Still with me? Well... You get in the outtakes then, aren't you? So until next time, take care of yourselves, be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing, and have a great, great day. This is Horror Podcast. I mean, I, I would argue honestly, it's... you live you live in Japan, so you yeah. are recording this even closer to the release date than me. <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know, absolutely <laughs> disgraceful. I mean, I I was gonna say, you know, but doesn't it make sense to be talking to someone when you can actually buy the book? But I'm not gonna say that because then, you know, that would be. Hanging out, my friend Rob Olson. It's like, so you've just dissed the entire concept <laughs> of his podcast in the first few minutes. So.
That's why I haven't said that. Well, the our Venn diagram just doesn't really overlap much. Like I handle pre-release and you handle at or after release. And then, you know, there's just that little, maybe a little overlap, but. And I um, handle uh, release. I yeah. mainly specify in releasing. That's my thing is I release. I'm not a fan of the pre-release or the post-release, but the act of releasing, I'm pretty much a fan of. I think yeah. if I had, you know, I mean, obviously release is the best, but if I had to, you know, also do a lot of pre-releasing <laughs> or post-releasing, I mean, post-release is probably better, like particularly if there's a lot of pre-release. So the thing with post-release is I'm usually left kind of disappointed and ashamed and pre-release can be fun like especially like if you're right on the edge of pre-release then you stop but then after so long you just kind of like lose feeling and like the act of releasing and then it's like ah what's the point of even continuing but right in those seconds of release that's that's the best well so we know how you're gonna feel yeah i'm talking about come (laughs) <laughs> I don't know about you guys. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking yeah. about come. <laughs> Time to change this podcast to the come penalty, right? Right, guys? <laughs> <laughs> this is why you invited me or, on the show. Or this is come, I guess. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Are you regretting your decision to invite me on as the <laughs> the co-host for this particular episode of Arc Party? I'll, I'll be honest, if we'd have been speaking to Joe Lansdale, this isn't this isn't how the episode would have started. Yeah, that's true. I'm gonna get Joe Lansdale on my podcast. I'm gonna ask him. He's gonna say yeah because he's he just I know him. And I'm gonna get him to talk about cum. I spilled a fucking god. <laughs> I am, that's my new mission, is to get Joe Lansdale to do a podcast where we mostly talk about ejaculate. I think I can make it happen. I mean, if anyone can, it's that's my That's my edge. I will do it if we uh, if we sell, um, I don't know, a thousand pr- copies of this book. Yeah, I'll get Joe is, Lansdale to talk about cum. Is there a timeline that these copies have to be sold or is it just at any point yeah by uh by june 9th obviously okay oh sorry yeah six six nine yeah 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 oh i guess i guess neville countries it would be nine six but i'm i'm in the united states so six nine yeah so you're giving people till september 6th then i mean in the the uk september 11th (laughs) (laughs) the deadline is at 9 11 (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) Michael. Rob. I'm letting you steer this thing, so, yeah. Well, I think now we should jump. Oh, I thought you were letting me steer this thing. (laughs) I know, I'm sorry. (laughs) I'm I'm dealing this this shit. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Now, tell me what you'd like to do next, because I think that I'm just going to agree with it, but what would you like to do next? <laughs> what the fuck is this? <laughs> tell me what. That's what I was I going to I got this, guys. Do. I got Max this. Max got it. <laughs> um, next up, <laughs> uh, what would you like to talk about, Michael? <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> how How have you guys been? What's life like? Doing any fun projects lately, guys? <laughs> I'm the host now, I guess. Oh, all right. <laughs> so I will, I will, I'm going to cut in and say, and this can be cut out because this is kind of like maybe a little inside, but when I pitched the idea of doing this, Michael was like, hey, I don't know how this is going to work because I'm like, a, I lead my thing and you lead your thing. And, you know, how, I don't know how this is going to go. Um, and I think this is exactly what Michael was worried about was this specific <laughs> moment. So it almost uh, it makes happens. me happy that it happened because yeah. if it hit, if it hadn't, then it'd be like, oh, you know, but like, so it did. So that, that's good. You know what they say, you get three <laughs> podcast hosts in one room and it's a lot of, oh, you, you go ahead. That's what's happening with all of us right yeah. now. Yep. That's the age old saying. 
SDA. <laughs> Time immemorial. I mean, I, I was gonna <laughs> lead. I was gonna lead on to the next topic, but the fact that you stop to ask me what I want to talk about would imply to me that there's something that you want to talk about, Rob. So, what do you want to talk about? Oh, I mean, I I think that the thing I came most prepared to do was like kind of throw in my insights about individual stories, but I didn't know how much we were going to dive into individual stories versus like doing other stuff. So if that's something that we're reserving for later on in the discussion, I'm just, all the chambers are loaded, man. I'm just letting you know. He's ready to release. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> it's release time. <laughs> yeah. I can see yeah. that pre-release leaking from a man. Let's do it. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> you guys know I'm talking about cum, right? We <laughs> the talkers got very excited about the pre-release. Um, oh well, I mean, sometimes in podcasting, your guest just walks off. That just walks, happened. yeah, unceremoniously. Um, yeah, yeah, that's live podcasting for you. Sometimes the guest has enough. Sorry about but, that. Um, <laughs> It's okay. I did, think did, maybe did, someone did, rang the did, doorbell or something. That's a, a more sensible <laughs> suggestion as to what happened and where I was going. I was going to tie in what we've been talking about. And yeah, we. Yeah. Uh, he can't come. He's been snipped. Is that one of the words you can't say around your dog? You have to like spell it out so they don't know that's <laughs> the word you're saying. Come. Come. If you, I'm constantly if you, saying C U M. Yeah, the age old dilemma how to spell come. <laughs> so I mean, I think we've had podcast episodes about this, haven't we? Yeah, me, me and you, lots of we genuinely like the C U M C O M E discussion. It, I mean, that, yeah, is... so for those listening, what I think we decided on C U M is come as a noun, C O M E is come as a verb. And uh, C O M E A S Y O U A L E is a Nirvana song. <laughs> oh, for fuck's sake! Yeah. An important <laughs> distinction, yeah. Yes, yes. It I is. am on file today. That was not planned. It's fucking spontaneous. Next question. Let's go. I got it. Next question is for Rob. Do you have like a remote control webcam? <laughs> what just happened? Yeah. 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 So this is a combination. It's it's a confluence of two situations. So first of all, sometimes my office chair just goes like it lowers on its own. Yeah. I almost said goes down, but I knew how that was going to go. Uh, so yes, I do have a remote controlled webcam. And um, nice. so like I can kind of modify where it's looking. So I just wanted to make sure I was still framed up pretty nicely, even though my chair betrayed me. Yeah. Now, assuming that this goes into the final episode, and that might be a fairly big <laughs> assumption that this isn't edited out, <laughs> then it might be a kind of good time to make people aware that we have video versions of the podcast as well, because we're, yeah. we're making quite a lot of references to what is visually going on. So I, I imagine, too, that the kind of broadcast is going to be slightly different depending on whether you're viewing the This Is Horror YouTube or the ARC Party YouTube. Because, I mean, with us, we go for like whoever's speaking, the camera is on them. But if I don't know what your plan is, but if you're going to actually edit it together as you usually do, then you're going to see all cameras for your view, which actually... I mean, I wouldn't normally direct <laughs> my listeners or viewers away from, you know, my channel, but I think that might be better, particularly because there's been times, particularly at the start and indeed now as I'm talking, where Max is just doing some weird fucking shit. Uh, are you going to yeah. miss out on that if you just oh, yeah. got the This Is yeah, one? Like yeah, when we were when we were talking, he was just like pretending to read the book, or maybe he was actually reading the book. Yeah, so the video video editions are going to be yeah a little bit a little bit extra for you for sure. Yeah, Hi. yeah. 
and oh hey hello, Max. Max. Hi. I didn't even acknowledge that you you disappeared for <laughs> audio. Did you see audio what happened? Viewers. Um, I I, oh, I saw you leave the, the room and uh, yeah, you you had oh he's off again. <laughs> this is this is quite the video presentation. Um. Well, in terms of the, <laughs> in terms of the next segment, okay, guys. Welcome back. Um, feel free to leave that in. I'm okay with it. <laughs> I uh. I vomited the coffee out of my nose all over myself. Seriously? That's what just happened. Why didn't you do that on camera? <laughs> okay. I, uh, it went all over the ground, all over my clothes. It was disgusting. All because I said next question, and you said next question is for Rob. <laughs> and I wasn't <laughs> expecting that. And I just fucking shot it out of every little fist on my face. Oh my god, that was gross. <laughs> See what you well, call those only Robert. listening to the you, podcast. You hadn't used your webcam. Is this a man? No, 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 maybe. Well, those only pro- listening. Yeah. Uh, uh, just some um, some context for the listeners only. I've changed clothes mid-podcast. It's ridiculous. It's true. Yeah, because from, Michael yeah. said the next question is for Rob. That was it. <laughs> for the record, we're all three of us professional, like experienced <laughs> podcasters. Like we all know what we're doing, and we have a lot of experience. So, yeah. Taking my socks off now because they have gotten soggy with coffee vomit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that was one of the stories. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> wasn't expecting any I mean I didn't plan that to happen I'm not going to apologize because I believe it will make podcast gold but um, that's what happened it is uh, truly astounding <laughs> and perhaps marginally worrying that if you kind of total the podcast experience that the three of us have together it must be very close to three decades <laughs> And this is a, this is what cumulative three decades of podcasting will get you. <laughs> Coffee on Shit, the maybe. Crop. I think I began I began podcasting, I think, in twenty seventeen. What about you guys? So this is how I started in February twenty thirteen. Wow. April two thousand eleven. So uh, I've got twelve bad. twelve almost thirteen years. Wow. Has anyone ever vomited a coffee on the podcast? No. My building wow. was on fire one time. Not the same. <laughs> it might not be the same, and it wasn't the direction that I planned on taking this, but you got to tell us the story there. That, well, I have this kind of thing. I was thinking about this because, like, um, there has been some uh, drama in the apartment below me, and I was like, if there's gunfire or something, I don't know if I'm going to, I'm going to try and just like continue recording. Um, but I was in, I was living in Vermont at the time and um, I was living in this like five story building. And um, uh, it was right before uh, someone that we were interviewing was about to join the call. No, they had just joined the call, but we hadn't started the actual interview yet. And all of a sudden there's just this like alarm sound. Uh, and um. I knew it was in my building and Livius is like, what's that noise? And I was like kind of more annoyed than anything because everything was set and we were ready to go and we're just doing this thing. And I was like, the the fire alarm is going off. So I had to like get up and go downstairs and find out what was going on. Someone's kitchen was on fire or something like that, but it was nothing where I had to evacuate. So I was like, let's just do this because like the fire alarm had stopped going so that it wasn't going to affect the audio. So like someone's kitchen was on fire, but I just pushed through it. That's pretty awesome. (laughs) <laughs> you, nothing I'm stops me from podcasting, man. Yeah. <laughs> it, it occurs to me now that what happened with me could be described as a release, and now we only <laughs> the post-release, and I, I don't feel great. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a little ashamed, to be honest. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we've we've all had yeah. post-release shame at some point <laughs> in our life. So I, I think yeah. this is going to be a bit that a lot of our listeners can connect with. So 
that's good. You know, I hope some it. of the release got um, refilled it on the video. I don't know how much of it was on my cam, but it came right out of my mouth and my nose. That was painful. Well, I will... you've had painful releases, right? Occasionally. <laughs> yeah, this is a, a hill podcast, right? We can talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. You need to think that about 15 minutes ago we were going to jump into another story and it all got derailed <laughs> with one simple question. It's my fault. What do you want to talk about? <laughs> yeah. so we've talked about fish and the zombie story, right? Yeah. So, uh, isn't, uh, well, isn't that all you guys want like to, to promote? I mean, yes. <laughs> All right, you know, I'll, I'll, what, can I take the reins on this? Because, like, I have a then. story that I need to talk about, so. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> what do you need to talk about? No, oh, it's okay, one of the in, the in the book. book so. I thought you were just going to tell us <laughs> some yeah, yeah. event from your life. <laughs> so, yeah, by the way, this one time. No, uh, uh, oh, now I got to find it. Is it Every Breath is a Choice? Is that the one? Yeah, yeah. Uh, hang on. I want to make sure that's the right one. Uh, yeah. 